is this a great game or what? And welcome back to another episode. Thank you for following. Thank you for subscribing. You can catch us wherever you get your podcasts. Or we're also doing video on YouTube if your eyes can take two guys that sound a lot alike and look a lot alike. It's been an exciting week in Major League Baseball. Uh, on Monday, they celebrated Jackie Robinson Day, which is such a beautiful showing of how important Jackie Robinson was to the game of baseball in the country. Right. And Jerry Hairston is going to join us later in, in the show to talk about Jackie Robinson. But it's a beautiful thing, Jeffrey, when you look and see that every player on the field is wearing number 42 as a tribute to Jackie Robinson because he is the most important player in the history of the sport. Babe Ruth, for me, is number two, but it's not a close second. Jackie Robinson changed the game when he broke the color barrier in 1947, and he changed the country. Hank Aaron told me if it weren't for Jackie Robinson, I would have never played in the major leagues, not just because he broke the color barrier, but Jackie Robinson made young black men like Hank Aaron think, I can do this someday. Rex Barney was a pitcher for the Dodgers briefly. I knew Rex. He played with Jackie briefly, and he said, Tim, you cannot believe the disgraceful things that you heard from people yelling at Jackie Robinson, things of racism Ugh. and hate. And Rex told me, Jackie is the strongest man I've ever met in my life. And Frank Robinson told me that the lesson that Jackie taught everyone was the way to beat hatred, the way to beat racism is to beat them on the field. Wow. So Jackie's number, of course, is retired in perpetuity, number 42. Now, I don't want to be funny about this because this is not funny, but, you know, we're starting to catch on like how important he was. But about 15 years ago, a young player on the Nationals went to all the National League parks and he saw number 42 up in every park. And he looked at a teammate and said, how many teams did Jackie Robinson play for? (laughs) Well, I don't want to be flip about this. The point is Jackie Robinson played for one team, the Brooklyn Dodgers. Then they traded him to the New York Giants, who was the arch rival. And instead of him going to the Giants, he retired instead. Wow. Because he couldn't play for the team whose brains he wanted to beat out all those years. I think uh, Red Sox fans wish Babe Ruth had done that (laughs) instead of getting (laughs) traded for a musical and some money. (laughs) So we're going to get into more. I'm I'm excited to hear more from you, Dad, about the Jackie Robinson, the player, how good of a player he was on the field. And as you mentioned, Jerry Harrison Jr. is going to be joining us. His grandfather played in the Negro Leagues and then was a major league player his dad jerry harrison senior played in so we're going to get into all of that it's going to be an incredible showing for jackie robinson day but from jackie to jackson the player that everybody's talking about right now jackson holiday made his major league debut and finally got his first major league hit yeah i was there for his third game his first home game and he went over three and struck out three times (sighs) look jeff hardest game in the world to play he is the best prospect In the minor leagues, he is going to be a great major league player, but it just speaks again to how difficult this game can be. But he finally got his first hit, but through the whole experience, the way he carried himself, his poise, his maturity was amazing. Uh, James McCann, backup catcher for the Orioles, told me, he said, Jackson looks like he's 12 years old and he acts like he's 30 years old. That's how mature that kid is. That's how he got through the early slump and he's going to be a great player someday. And it's really important, Jeff. They allowed him to wear number seven. Matt Holliday, who's his dad, wore number seven. But the last Oriole to wear number seven was Cal Ripken Sr., Cal Jr.'s father. And Cal Sr. has everything to do with what we call the Oriole way, like how to teach people how to play the game properly. So the holidays called the Ripkins and said, can we, can Jackson wear number seven? And Cal and Billy Ripkin said, sure, it, it's great. And Cal just said, make sure you wear it with pride. Wow. Because that's how great Cal Ripkin Sr. was. And Jeff, a little off the topic, but he is the toughest man that I've ever met in a major league uniform in my life. I could tell you a hundred stories, but the only one you really need to know was Cal Sr. was a great soccer player. 
and he used to play soccer in the off season. He was 55 years old playing with a bunch of 25 year olds <laughs> and he would play the entire game midfield. And after the game, a couple times, Cal junior told me this Cal senior came home and he had a giant blood blister under his big right oh, toe. You know how painful those are that could be? Worse. So he took his oh. son, Cal Jr., who's like 10, and says, come downstairs with me. They go down into the wood shop. No. I'm not making Stop this up. It. In the basement, he takes out a power drill, and he drills a hole into his right big toe. It frees the blood, which comes spurting out <laughs> like this. He looks at his son and goes... Ooh, that feels good. That's where Cal Jr. gets his toughness from, is from Cal Sr. And now Jackson Holiday is wearing number seven, Cal Ripken Sr.'s number. I don't want to pick your story apart, but I know you're not the handiest guy in the world. You can just call it a drill. <laughs> All drills are powered. Right. <laughs> That's, it's kind of redundant, a power drill. There's no such thing as a hand drill. Very good, Jeff. Uh, our game changer of the week. We're going to do this each week on the episode. It's just one person who's making a difference in the game of baseball or has a significant moment this week in baseball, right? Who's our game changer this week? Yeah, I'm going with Andrew McCutcheon who hit home run number 300 wow. and he did it as a member member of the Pirates where he started his career, where he won an MVP. I've told you how talented Stephen Vogt is. He can sing, he can dance, he'd win a talent show. Uh, Andrew McCutcheon is right there with him. He's a great singer. He can dance. He can do impersonations. He does the, the greatest Eddie Murphy you can possibly imagine. <laughs> but he's also a baseball savant. Yeah, try to picture this, Jeff. As an eighth grader, he went to high school. You know, the, the school he went to was like one through 12. As an eighth grader, he made the varsity baseball team and he led the county in hitting as an eighth grader wow. playing against 12th grade boys. So Matt Diaz lived in Florida at the same time. Matt went to Florida State. He hit five home runs, by the way, in a college baseball game. And now he's a double A baseball player. He's a professional baseball player, and he's teaching Andrew McCutcheon, 14 years old at the time, how to hit, all right? And after three lessons, Matt Diaz says to Andrew McCutcheon, I can't help you anymore. You're a better hitter than I am. He's 14 years old. That's amazing. That's our game changer of the week. And uh, I, I just know, I remember when he signed to come back to Pittsburgh, those fans were so happy and so excited because it was like he was coming home. Right. He is revered there. You know, there's Clemente, there's Willie Stargell, maybe a few others, but Andrew McCutcheon is on that short list for sure. And another player who's revered in Major League Baseball. Big news for the New York Mets. Dwight Gooden gets his number retired and is a member of the New York Mets Hall of Fame now. Right. He is one of the greatest pitchers I've ever seen. Let me let me tell you how great he was. He started the 1986 All-Star Game. And back then, you they, since it was played in the National League Park, they were batting in the All-Star Game. The pitchers were batting. <laughs> so Roger Clemens is facing Dwight Gooden. And Clemens is like the best pitcher in baseball. He's facing... Gooden, who's like the second best pitcher. So Clemens hasn't batted since high school because they have the DH in college and in the minor leagues. So the first time he's batted since high school, he's facing Dwight Gooden, who's throwing 98 with a, with a thing that just jumps like this. So after the first pitch, he looks at the home plate umpire and says, Clemens does, do I throw that hard? And the umpire goes, yes, Roger, you throw, throw that, that hard. hard. And that was a seminal <laughs> moment in Roger Clemens' career because he recognized anyone who throws that hard, you cannot hit that. So that's when Clemens went back to throwing fastballs up in the strike zone because he got a, a firsthand look at Dwight Gooden. That's how great Dwight <laughs> Gooden was. And on a, a sadder note, Jerry Grody died. Jerry mm. Grody is in the New York Mets Hall of Fame. Catcher on the 1969, the famous 69 Mets championship team. Tom Seaver told me story after story about what a great defensive catcher Jerry Grody was and one of the all-time tough guys ever to, to play the game. Rest in peace, Jerry Grody. We have a, a happy birthday shout-out for this week to a friend of yours, a 
former teammate of yours at ESPN, right? Uh, Bruce Bochy? Yeah. No, he was never a teammate. I thought, no, I thought no. he did broadcasting with you, no? No. <laughs> as soon as Boch retired, he went home and didn't do anything for two years, three years. <laughs> and then he came back and he won a World Series. So Bruce Bochy has won four World Series in his time. Over 2,000 wins. The day he retires, he will be a first ballot Hall of Famer. He, nobody but nobody ever ran a bullpen better than Bruce Bochy. And no one has a better feel with his players. Like when the Rangers last year, the world champion Rangers got into a horrendous slump. They lost 20 out of 30. He never panicked. He never showed how upset he was. And he guided them through and they ended up the wor- winning the World Series. The thing you... You may know about Bruce Bochy is he has the biggest head of anyone who's played Major League Baseball. And I asked him about it, and he's he's happy to share it. He wore an eight and an eighth hat, Jeff, helmet. So he told me he got traded twice in his career. And when he got traded, he had to take his batting helmet with him <laughs> and spray paint it the colors of his new team because he knew his new team would not have a helmet that would fit eight and an eighth head. So he once, you know, he was a backup catcher and not a really good hitter, but he had a walk-off homer once against Nolan Ryan. He's the only wow. player ever hit a walk-off homer off of Nolan Ryan. Jeff, picture today's game. Any starting pitcher still being in the game to give up (laughs) a walk-off homer. It's impossible. So he hits a walk-off homer against Nolan Ryan. And the Padres, who loved Bruce Bochy, they ran a red carpet from the beginning of the clubhouse all the way to his locker. And in his locker, in his helmet, they had a six-pack of beer with ice (laughs) In his helmet. So Terry Kennedy, who was the everyday catcher on that team, told me years later, he said, you know, you can get a six-pack of beer in a lot of guys' helmets, but only in Boach's helmet can you get a six-pack of beer with ice. <laughs> and that's Bruce Bochy. So you tried on. For for those who watch on YouTube, uh, you can check us out. Is this a great game or what? Search for it on YouTube. I'm going to put this picture in the video. It is, it is a photo of... Of my dad wearing Bruce Bochy's Giants hat, and to say you look like a child, <laughs> you're you're hit it. You can't That's even a, see your eyes. A grown man, right there. Now let me k- tell you the quick story here. Rick Sutcliffe, my mischievous former teammate, <laughs> he said, "Tim, you got to put Bochy's hat on, and you got to put my jacket on. I wear a 38 short. That's a 52 extra long. That's the jacket. I have a seven and an eighth. That's an eight and an eighth. Look, I look like Tom Hanks and." big there it's <laughs> unbelievable and and i took that they took that picture of me in bruce bochy's office after a giants game years ago but only because rick sutcliffe said tim this will this will be great well it's not great it's ridiculous but it's pretty darn funny and we're gonna put it up in our youtube channel but also if you haven't followed us yet we're on twitter we're on instagram we're on facebook at great game or what we'll put the photo up as well i have a feeling this is going to be our most popular photo <laughs> we post. <laughs> great one <laughs> Let's move on to our quirk gins. These are the the fun things that make baseball baseball different than any other sport. The fascinating things that happen, and I have one to start us off. I'm sure you have a hundred. Well, uh, Jeff, I'm proud you have one. That's great. You're All starting right. to think like your dad. Not a good idea. Which most is of the terrible. Time. It's right. ruining my marriage. <laughs> so <laughs> we've got Josh and Bo Naylor, right, of the Cleveland Guardians. They hit a home run in the same inning last week. Now, I know, stay with me, they're not the only siblings to do that for the same team, hit a home run in the same inning. I looked it up. I was excited. But I believe they're the only brothers to hit a home run in the same inning on National Sibling Day. See, this is the beauty of baseball, and good for you for finding that. The beauty of baseball, these amazing coincidences happen all the time. By the way, this is the second time that the Naylor brothers have hit a home run in the same inning. So only three other sets of brothers have ever done that. The Wainer brothers, the Ripken brothers, and the Upton brothers. And by the way, way off the topic, I was in, I, I was a dugout reporter for years, and I'm in the Braves dugout when BJ and Justin Upton are both on the Braves. And BJ Upton comes up to me. I'm in the dugout during the game. He's in uniform. He's playing in the game, and he asks me, uh, my brother and I were wondering, how, what size shoe do you wear? And I went, what? So I had my little shoes on. I, I, I said they're a seven and a half. And he went, wow, 
oh, those are small. Like that. Like in the middle of a game, he and his brother, <laughs> instead of, and they were both really good players yeah. and funny guys, but they were fascinated by the size of my feet in the middle of a baseball game. Only in baseball could that happen. I have to give a quick shout out to uh, my childhood friend, Jensen, who not a big baseball fan, but it listens every week and, and says the podcast is helping him become a fan. He's the one who brought up the Josh and Bo Naylor thing to me at first said, it's that ever happened before. Jensen came up with a quirk. Jen- Jensen came up with a quirk gin. So, Jensen, thank you for listening and thank you for the for the tip there. National Sibling Day was last week. Right. And I told you I wanted to ask you if you celebrated today's National Day, which is National Wear Your Pajamas to Work Day. R- really? And I think uh, many people have asked, what does Tim Kirkshin wear to sleep? Are you a shorts and t-shirt? Are you a boxers and t-shirt? Are you shirtless? How does that work? Uh... Jeff, we th- this is way too personal. As you know, I'm I'm the coldest man on earth. You have been asked I wear by s- Levitard if you if you pee sitting down or standing all right, up. All right, all right, all right. This is I, our podcast. I, we can ask whatever. I wear usually sweatpants to bed. <laughs> I wear a t-shirt at least sometimes more. I've worn socks to bed many many times because I don't want my feet to get cold. And speaking of pajamas, I haven't worn a pair of pajamas since I was like seven years old. I have never owned a, a pair of slippers. I have never actually worn a real robe before, and I do not own a pair of sandals of any kind because I don't want anyone seeing my feet because my feet aren't any worse than your feet. But my feet look terrible. Nobody is going to look at my toes unexposed, exposed toes. I'm, I'm, I'm going to cover up my feet no matter what. You're doing a service to us all. <laughs> and we, we very much appreciate it because I've right. seen those feet in the sand and right. nobody else needs right. to see Enough that. Enough of the pajamas. We're back to the quirk jeans. Quirk jeans. So Tyler O'Neill, who's been on like every episode we've done so far. <laughs> He's very so popular. He hit six home. He's got seven home runs through Sunday, April the 14th. He was leading the American League in home runs. He's had a great start. But his first six home runs led to a total of six RBIs. So he had no other hits to drive in a run. He had six homers, six RBIs. No player since 1920 has ever hit, only had six homers after hitting, I mean, six RBIs after hitting their first six home runs. No one's ever done that. I found that fascinating. But So you're telling me no runners on. Every no, homer he's right, hit no, is a right. solo home. All six are solo and what? no other hit to drive in a run. So six and six <laughs> had never happened since 1920. But the sixth homer, I love this, it cleared the monster at, at uh, Fenway, Fenway Park, Park. And it broke a window of a car parked beyond. And, and this is a true story, Jeff. I know it sounds apocryphal, but in 1995, Mark McGuire hit a ball that went out of the stadium. And out of the stadium, there was a guy who had locked his keys in his car and had no way to get his keys <laughs> out. And like, 30 minutes later, Mark McGuire hit a home run that smashed the guy's windshield and he was able to reach in, open up the door and get his keys out. He he got the baseball and somehow got it to Mark McGuire, explained the story and McGuire wrote something like, I'm glad I could help you with your keys. So... This is what happens when you play games at Fenway Park. Not only do you hit the ball over the fence, out of the ballpark, you might break somebody's windshield and actually save his day. Now, I only had one quirk gin for today, but your mind is just riddled with them. Is that all you have, or do you have no, more to go through? No, I have through? many more. So, Ellie De La Cruz. No, I <laughs> love this. Ellie, no, me too. Ellie De La Cruz, who's the six foot five inch shortstop for the Cincinnati Reds, he hit... Two home runs in one game, one left-handed, one right-handed, and one of them was an inside-the-park homer. So the last player to hit two homers in one game, one from each side of the plate, and one was an inside-the-park homer was Carlos Guillen 20 years ago, 2004. I love that. The Mets, by the way, the Mets have... In their first 24 stolen base attempts against them, didn't throw out anyone. The opponents were 24 for 24. The last team to allow 24 consecutive successful steals at the start of a season was the 1987 Brewers. So that's how far we go back on that. And Jeff, you also know how much uh, I think bunting should be a part of the game, right? Right. We we talk about that. It's a part of the essential being the small ball game. Right, right. So... 
Um, Getting his Raiders White Sox, on. The White Sox had recently had three sacrifice bunts in one game. We only had one game last year in which a team had three sacrifice bunts. And the year before, only one time did a team have three sacrifice bunts in one game, and we already have one, which is great. By the way, the Braves at that time had three sacrifice bunts in their last 334 games. So they're getting a sacrifice bunt on average one every, you know, 110 games is basically <laughs> what it comes down to. That that's how little we care about the sacrifice bunt. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't you can't be fascinated by both, okay? You are fascinated by sacrifice right. flies. Check out the book at your local Amazon. But you are, is the next one going to be called I'm fascinated by sacrifice sac- bunts? No, uh, sacrifice flies are more interesting than sacrifice bunts. I'll give you that. But I, I, I love bunting. I love anything that that make that allows you to work. So we also had something I've never seen before in my life. Zach McKinstry, who's an infielder for the Tigers, is in the ninth inning the other day, and a ground ball was hit to him, and it resulted in an error that led to three runs scoring. On an, on an error by an infielder. Think about that, Jeff. Look, if, a, if an outfielder drops a ball with the bases right. loaded, maybe everyone scores. So I checked with Frank at the Elias Sports Bureau, and Frank told me that he finally found it. Uh, Pete Alonso in 2019 was the last infielder to make an error that directly scored three runs on one play. And then in the same inning, Zach McKinstry was sent in to pitch and he gave up a three-run homer in the game. So in the same inning, he made an error that led to three runs. And then as a pitcher, he's not a pitcher, but he had to pitch. He gave up a three-run homer. That's wow. that's never happened in the history of baseball. Wow, that is a serious quirkchen right there. Right. And there, there, there's so many of them, Jeff, because, again, I have a curious mind. I have nothing else to do with my life other than be with my children and my grandchildren. But the other thing, I, I love at bats, my, you know, seeing who's batting against who. So we had a Bobby Miller, Mike Bush, Michael Bush. So we had a Miller Bush <laughs> at bat. So uh, we, we should... Drink a beer to that, right? We should. Right. I mean, you know, the funny thing about drinking a beer with my dad is is for a long, long time, my dad's question, depending on asking how, I guess, how much alcohol is in a drink or how drunk is it going to get him, he would say, how many Bud Lights <laughs> does this drink equal? <laughs> and he would ask that. So uh, the answer is Miller, Bush, it's all the same. Right. At that so point. your mom and I, when we went to, to uh, Montana years ago, we went into a brewery oh, in Montana. No. And this is like a re- like the, the brewery is in the place and it's in Montana and the white fish is like the coolest place ever. So mom and I go in there and dopey me who knows nothing about drinking, nothing about beer. I say, uh, uh, I'll have a Bud Light. And the guy looked at me like I had like, the bartender, like I had like 10 heads. And he said, we don't have any Bud Lights here. I said, well, what's the closest thing you have to a Bud Light? And he pointed to the water fountain in the corner. That's what he thought. Because he runs a microbrewery where they have all these great beers. So so we had a Miller versus Bush, which is pretty good. You know, I like to put things in your perspective. Asking the brewmaster for a Bud Light yeah. at a brewery is like a guy from the stands seeing Randy Johnson in his prime. So I think I could get one to left center. <laughs> That's how insulting Look, that is. Right. I know. And believe me, he was completely insulted with what I did. But the last two years, we've had, we've had a Jake Berger... He faced John King. Yeah, so we Burger had a Burger King, Burger King at Love that. It. And then the year after, we had Jake Burger against Michael King. So we had two Burger King at bats in a span of two years. Somebody put together their favorite fantasy baseball matchups that they always wanted to see, including Dennis Leonard and Joel Skinner. It would be Leonard, Leonard Skinner, Skinner. Right. Love or it. Al Holland and Johnny Oates would be Holland Oates. <laughs> That one might be my favorite because it's not quite Hall and Oats. It's Holland Oats. Right. I I love it. There are clever people out there that do this, but only with baseball. What about uh, J.R. Richard and Ted Simmons? Richard Richard Simmons. Simmons. Have you ever taken one of those classes? Uh, No, absolutely not. You ever worn that kind of outfit? And they faced each other, J.R. Richard and Ted Simmons. Did they really? Yes, they did. Absolutely. What about Jim Barr and Mike Heath? 
Heath Bar. Yeah, Heath Bar. That's, that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, a re- I don't know if, how many of those actually happened yet, but this happened. Um, Elvis Luciano pitched against Elvis Andrews in a game a, a few years ago. So we had the Elvis versus Elvis, Ooh. which is pretty hard to do. It's a pretty unusual name. And it ended in a single, which yeah. is great because... Elvis had 117 singles, which, <laughs> which is great. But just to finish, Jeff, on uh, the greatest one that never happened was the Cubs used to have an infielder named Darwin Barney. And the Dodgers had a pitcher named Stephen Fife. Now, this is only going to matter to our old people out there, yeah. unfortunately. So I track this. This is going to happen. We're going to have a Stephen Fife against Darwin Barney. We're going to have a Barney Fife at bat. <laughs> and anyone who loves Andy and Mayberry, the Andy Griffith show, Barney Fife is one of the greatest sitcom characters ever. So I am I am prepared for this. I can't wait. Today's the day. Stephen Fife is going to Wrigley Field to pitch, and Darwin Barney is going to play. And Dale Swaim the manager of the Cubs, just gives Darwin Barney a day off, and he didn't play that day. I will never speak to Dale Swaim ever again (laughs) for the rest of my life. He blew the greatest at bat in the history of baseball. Barney Fife, it never happened, and I, I am so disappointed to this day. I am so disappointed that after years of reporting on this game, you have never made an enemy. You taught me as a kid, never burn a bridge. You burned a bridge over That's the it. dumbest thing. Right. And Dale Sway would that I love Dale Sway. He'd just look at me and go, Tim, you got to get a life, man. Right. And he would be right. I'm excited to put you to the test with It's in the Cards. We open up a deck of cards from Tops, and we just read through the cards and talk about the players. So let's get this started here. Okay. Oh, oh, look at this. Right out of the gate, we got Boston Red Sox, Kenley Jansen. Another shout out to my buddy Jensen (laughs) for the cork gin earlier in the show. Not Jensen, but Jansen here. So on Sunday, April the 14th, Kenley Jansen just recorded to save number 424, which ties him now with John Franco for fifth most saves of all time. But Kenley Jansen, Jeff, as you know, is an enormous man. And he was a catcher in the minor leagues, and then they turned him into a pitcher, and he's become really one of the best relief pitchers of all time. And I love this so much that in 2016, Clayton Kershaw of the Dodgers, the best pitcher in the game at the time, got a save in a postseason game. This is 2016 because they ran out of pitchers. Mm -hmm. He had to come in and save it. It was his first save and his only save since he saved a game in the minor leagues in 2006. And his catcher that day was... Kenley no way. Jansen. How great is that? And then they were teammates when he got that save for the Dodgers. They were teammates. All right, Charlie Morton, uh, they were roommates. Reference to a TikTok. Sorry, that was a, deep, <laughs> that was a bad, that was a bad uh, reference. Charlie Morton of the Braves. Right, Charlie Morton is a renaissance man, Jeff. He can play the guitar. He, uh, Uncle Matt was so great with his hands, building things, carpentry, yeah. building... Charlie Morton is that way. He's also like the greatest barbecue cook you've ever seen, like cooking meat. He's got a, he's got a big gigantic like grill at his house that he can hook up to the back of his car. So he can like, if they're going away or if they want to go into the woods and cook or something, he has a, an attachment like, you can bring the grill with you. He's And he explained to me the whole process. You know, he wakes up at 2 o'clock in the morning to get the meat going. So so just to tell you how stupid Twitter could be, or e can, X can be, whatever it's called now. <laughs> I jokingly said on the air, knowing how much he loves to cook meat, I said on the air in a game I was doing, I said, Charlie Morton should consider opening his own steakhouse and and call it Morton's. And some guy writes in, he goes, Tim, you are an idiot. Don't you even know there is a chain of steakhouses called Morton's? Yes, I knew that. I was trying to make a joke and you didn't even get it. This is your redemption. You can yell at people from Twitter on your podcast. Right. (laughs) I deserve it. That's a good one. No, no, you don't. Jonathan India of the Cincinnati Reds. Now, I want to say real quick, it's in the cards. You're listening on the podcast, right? We're ripping this right out of the deck. If you watch on YouTube, you can actually see the cards and be looking at, you know, 
the cards themselves from top. Sorry, go ahead. Jonathan Indy is a really good player, infielder. He can really hit University of Florida, and he's on my all-country team. I was going. I didn't want to put you on the spot. Well, Who I, else is I on that team? A guy named Bill Poland is the catcher. <laughs> I, I can't. <laughs> I don't think I could do this off the top of my head. Tim Tim Ireland's at first. Uh, 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 Ty France is at second. Right. German, right. Germany Schaefer is at shortstop. Uh, Chad Pinder's in the outfield. Brian Jordan's in the outfield. Wow. God, I can't believe I can't. And oh, Jonathan India's in the infield. Right. Right. Did so, you know? Did you know that we have like I'm not kidding, like six listeners in Australia. Really? We have six listeners in Australia. So let can we can we give them a good day, mate? Yeah, good day, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Throw a shrimp on the bobby. They don't even call it a shrimp there, by the way. It's a prawn. It's a it's not a shrimp. All right, all right. Oh and so gosh. Jonathan India is on yeah. and yeah, my pitchers, of go. course, are Derek Holland and Mark Portugal. But yeah. I asked I asked Jonathan India once about his name and I said, Jonathan, it is an unusual name. And he goes, you can't believe this. People come up to me all the time and say, are you, are you from India? And he says, no. no, I'm not from India. I'm from Florida. It's just my last name is India. So he's on the all country team that I came up with. And Mike Monaco, my partner yeah. at ESPN, he's the broadcaster for the team. That is <laughs> right. He has to be. Right. You know, that is almost as dumb of a question. My wife is a twin, but she has a twin brother. And she claims many times people ask after hearing, oh, you have a twin brother? Are you guys identical? Right. <laughs> That's seriously. She gets that question. Right. Are you from India? Ronald Acuna Rocco Baldelli, by the way, the manager of the twins. Yeah. His wife had twins. Yeah. Recently. He's the manager of the twins. He's not the manager of the Cardinals. I just got He's there. the manager of the twins, and his wife had twins. That is so baseball. Right. That is so perfect. All right. Uh, next up, it's in the cards. Ronald Acuna Jr. with the Braves. I like the pose he's doing on this card, too. All right. Now, we all know how great Ronald Acuna Jr. is, so I'm, I'm not going to tell you anything other than Chipper Jones last year looked at me. Chipper Jones, one of the four greatest third basemen of all time, one of the four greatest switch hitters of all time, he looked at me and said, Ronald Acuna Jr. is the most talented player I've ever seen wow. wear a major league uniform. That's who we're talking about. Last year, no, no one had ever hit 30 homers and stolen 60 bases in a season. He went 40-70. That's how good that kid is. Wow. And, uh, yeah, that, that's what we wrapped up. I mean, last but not least, I'm excited. This is Mookie Betts. And we're going to be talking to Jerry Harrison Jr. here soon, who's a broadcaster for the Dodgers and a former major league player who played in both the infield and the outfield. And I'm, I, I want to ask him about what Mookie Betts is doing. Is it as amazing as it seems to me, at least to just be like, Hey, can you play shortstop for us? Sure. I'll play shortstop. Right. Th this is unprecedented. What Mookie Betts is doing. Only two players, Tony Womack and Tom Tresh have ever played a hundred games in the outfield and then gone and played 70 or more games at shortstop the following season. And that's what Mookie Betts is doing. But with all due respect to Tony Womack and Tom Tresh, they weren't six-time gold glove outfielders. They weren't second in the MVP. And he moves from being the premier defensive right fielder and moves to the middle infield. It's amazing what Mookie Betts can do. And Jerry Harrison is going to tell us all about him. Yeah, that interview is coming up. Um, but right now, similar to It's in the Cards, putting you kind of up against it here, it's called... The league in the lid, okay? So I've put every single team. Now we've taken out the teams we've already done. So the Reds out, the Yankees, Yankees out. out. Right. So now we have 28 Major League Baseball teams. Off the top of your head, you got to tell me either what's happening now for them or maybe a historical fact about them. We've got the Milwaukee Brewers up this week. Okay, the Brewers are one of the real surprise teams so far of 2024. They just had a seven-game stretch, Jeff in which they scored six or more runs in each game. In the history of the franchise, they've only done that twice, 1982 and 1989. And again, this was not supposed to be a really good hitting Brewers team right now, but so far it has been. And by the way, that 82 Brewers team is one of my favorite teams ever. They were called Harvey's Wall Bangers because Harvey Keene was the manager and they just crushed the ball all over the field. Robin Yount, Paul Molitor were the stars of that team. But 
my favorite player on that team in a lot of ways was Jim Gantner, who was their tough little second baseman. His nickname was Gumby number 17. So Jim Gantner, while he played for the Brewers, also owned a lube shop where you can a lube shop, like where you can take your car in to get it fixed. Oh, thank so goodness. as <laughs> as part of a an auction item that the Brewers did, Jim Gantner would go to people's houses and change their oil in their driveway <laughs> while he was the second baseman for the Milwaukee Brewers. Now I know it was for you know it was for charity and it was an auction item, but I just love it that the second baseman knocks on the door and says, "Hi, I'm Jim Gander. I'm, I'm here, here to, to change, change your oil." <laughs> That's a great story. We want to get to our sack fly tracker. This is because you're fascinated by sacrifice flies. So where are we at in the season and the significance of sack flies this year? All right. Well, I love sacrifice flies. I think they're great. So Nolan Arenado hit a sacrifice fly just the other day. So that's number 70 for him. So he Mm. is the all-time leader among active players in sacrifice flies with 70. Now, we've only charted them from 1954 on. So we can't go all the way back because you used to get a sacrifice fly at least for a short period, if you advanced a runner from second to third or even oh. first to second. But it's been the same rule since 1954. But the interesting part is from 54 on, the player with the most sacrifice flies in baseball is Eddie Murray with 128. Second on that list is his dear friend and his teammate, Cal Ripken, with 127. And yet Eddie Murray, <laughs> who is the all-time leader in sacrifice flies for a career, never led the league in sacrifice flies during any season. Now, think about that. It's like being the all-time home run king, but never leading your leading in home runs, or the NBA's leading scorer all-time, but never leading the league right. in scoring. That's that's how weird sacrifice flies can be. And I, Josh Naylor hit another. Just right. didn't so, Naylor another he, reference. Right. Here. He had two in one game, Josh Naylor. Really? Yes. How about that? That doesn't happen very often. And that's our sack fly tracker. Before we get to Jerry Harrison Jr. and talk a little bit more about Jackie Robinson Day celebrating this past Monday in Major League Baseball. And uh, I'm really looking forward for that conversation. I want to kind of round out our conversation from last week. We gave our listeners a hypothetical. Would they rather have $10,000 cash or 24 hours to hit a hole-in-one in in a 135-yard par three to get a million dollars if you do it? 51.5% of our listeners are taking the shot at a million dollars. I'm not saying it was overwhelming. It's close to 50-50. It is really close. But you said you would definitely take the... uh, thousand or ten thousand dollars off the bat but that's because i know your swing isn't what it used to be 135 yards it's like a five iron now right jeff i'm 67 (laughs) i have an art it is and i have an artificial hip and i would be exhausted after an hour let alone 24 hours so i just don't think it's going to work for me the mathematics are against me so i'm taking the 10 grand it's a gift harold it's a hockey season right take the ten thousand dollars uh so With that being said, we talked to John Smoltz about the Masters. Big, big shout-out Scotty Scheffler for his victory. SS. And I was just out of curiosity thinking, okay, is he the best double, single, you know, initial, first initial S, second initial S, same initial as first and last name? This is what you've done to me, by the way. (laughs) This is the curse of the Kirkshans. And I I don't think he's the greatest golfer with the same first and last initial. You got Ernie Els. You got Sam Snead. But who would you say, Dad, is the greatest baseball player with the same first and last initial jeff are, are you coming up with this on your own when when are you asleep when this comes in are you in the shower i love it right when you're i starting know to think like me which is not healthy i've told right. you a million times <laughs> don't be like me don't but i want to don't I, clip out every box score for 20 years it's not healthy so i prepared my answer and i just you all right, go all right. I, I'm, i've been stalling as i try to come up with so i barry bonds has to be the greatest yeah but people are going to say Barry Bonds. I'm not saying it. He's the third greatest hitter of all time for me after Babe Ruth and Ted Williams. I've never seen a better hitter than Barry Bonds, period. But but I'm going to take Mickey Mantle instead because Mickey Mantle, in a lot of ways, changed the game. When Mickey Mantle broke into the big leagues, I'm going to be real close on this. 
the percentage of switch hitters were three percent of the players mm. were switch hitters after Mickey Mantle came along and became the greatest switch hitter of all time like 30 years later 28 percent of the players wow. were switch hitters you know why Jeff because these dads grew up watching Mickey Mantle mm-hmm. play and they told their sons hey if you want to be one of the greatest players of all time and Mickey Mantle was one of the greatest players of all time become a switch hitter so in a lot of ways he changed the game so I'm going with MM but I love your Scotty Scheffler I don't think he's Sam Snead but uh, it's pretty he's pretty darn good well I'm going to challenge you for next week because I think Barry Bonds BB which is walk right he walked a lot in addition to the amount of home runs next week I want you to think of the best hr home run initials hr best player with hr of all time don't do it now because you're not going to be able to sleep i've already got a george herman ruth no that's (laughs) ghr go all right go that's grand home run i don't think it works that way um all right so before we get to Jerry Harrison Jr. and talking about Jackie Robinson, we mentioned it at the top, but I want to hear from you what kind of player Jackie Robinson was. Well, again, we get lost a little bit, as we should, in what a trailblazer he was, what a pioneer he was, and how important he was to the game. But let's not forget, Jeff, how great a player he was. He's the greatest player for me in the history of the Dodgers. Jackie Robinson, one. Sandy Koufax, two. This is my list. Nobody else's. Clayton Kershaw, three. Uh, Duke Snyder, fourth. As far as second baseman go, you could make a case he's one of the Mount Rushmore second basemen. For me, it's Rogers Hornsby, Joe Morgan, Eddie Collins, Jackie Robinson. Dave Anderson, great columnist, Hall of Famer for the New York Times, once wrote that Jackie Robinson could beat you more ways in a game than anybody else. Now, frankly, I disagree. I think Willie Mays could beat you in more ways, but Jackie Robinson was a great defensive second baseman, wildly underrated, a really good hitter lifetime, 300 hitter, and he won an MVP, he won the Rookie of the Year, and one of the great base runners in the history of the sport. And Jeff, the reason he was so good is he was an amazing athlete. He was an All-American running back at UCLA. He led the Pac-10 in scoring in basketball Two years in a row. He was a track star. He was a great golfer. He was a tennis player. And for me, he's one of the four greatest second basemen of all time. That's who Jackie Robinson is, one of the greatest athletes ever to play the sport. And to repeat, the most important player in the history of baseball. Coming up, Jerry Harrison Jr. joins us. He's a member of the Dodgers broadcasting team. He is of a lineage of baseball players his grandfather was a negro league player and a major league baseball player his father as well and of course he had quite the career can't wait to talk to him more about the life and legacy of jackie robinson along with a lot more that's coming up next is this a great game or what welcomes a former major leaguer Three generation Major League Baseball family. Jerry Harrison Jr. is on the podcast. Jerry, thank you for joining us. Jeff and Tim, how are you guys doing? Glad to be here. Major League Baseball, April 15th, celebrating Jackie Robinson Day. A huge day, in, important to the history of the game, but not only the game of our country, right? Can you explain a little bit the impact Jackie had, not only on, on baseball as a whole, but as uh, on the United States? Well, Jeff, you said it right. You know, it was the impact on our country. And, you know, we always talk about black baseball, the Negro Leagues, but this is American history. You know, Jackie Robinson, when he made his Brooklyn Dodgers debut, Martin Luther King really stated back then that that kind of sparked the civil rights movement. They had a guy in Jackie Robinson who was very articulate, extremely smart. Uh, He had accomplished so much prior uh, leading up to his major league debut. Obviously, he served in our military, uh, played at UCLA. I believe he starred in four different sports at UCLA. So he was really accomplished. So they had the perfect guy uh, to represent the black baseball players uh, and and to break the color barrier. Yes, were there better players? And even Jackie Robinson admitted back then there were better players than him. But he was the he was probably the best guy for the job uh, to break through. And obviously, he thrived on the baseball field. Uh, while kind of holding his tongue uh, when he had to, and it allowed for other uh, people of color to, to play eventually. So 
Martin Luther King said it best, Jackie Robinson, seeing Jackie Robinson on that baseball field thrive allowed, it really kind of sparked the civil rights movement. Right. Jerry, your grandfather, Sam, what did he tell you about Jackie Robinson when you were growing up? You know, as a kid, we all knew about Jackie Robinson, the player. The one thing my grandfather always stressed was look at Jackie Robinson, the person, what he represented. You know, it was not just on the field, but off the field. You got to be a good person. That's one thing my grandfather and my father stressed. Uh, listen, it'd be cool to be a baseball player. Of course, you want to play baseball. But the most important thing is to be a good man, be a good representative of your family. And obviously, Jackie Robinson did that. And he represented so many others. And because he was successful on and off the field, it allowed for so many other players to come behind him. So, you know, having Jackie Robinson Day and having his number retired. And I remember Ken Griffey Jr. You know, saying we should all wear 42 on that day. Uh, and just just giving a little tribute to him for a man who meant so much for so many people. And Jerry, you just brought that up. You know, all the players going to be rocking 42 and, and you had a great major league career. But, you know, you're a broadcaster for the Dodgers now, but you played for the Dodgers. Was it kind of like sending chills up your spine when you put the 42 jersey Dodgers on the front and 42 on the back? Was that kind of cool? Absolutely. Uh, and I, I, I got a chance to play second base one day. Uh, I think it was either 12 or 13 uh, when I was wearing that Dodger blue, wearing 42 and playing second base. And trust me, guys, it was not lost on me. I was thinking about my grandfather and just knowing the, the, the players that sacrificed so much. The one thing my grandfather, who was the ninth black player to play in Major League Baseball, was the first black player uh, to play with the Chicago White Sox. It wasn't lost on me on how these guys really had to, to, to sh kind of struggle a little bit and grind. They had to play in so many barnstorming games. They had to go uh, play in Mexico, in Cuba, Venezuela, uh, other countries to kind of make sure they provide for their family. So, you know, my, my grandfather and other players had to do that. Uh, and, you know, they definitely had it a whole lot tougher than we did. And we're so appreciative for, for the stuff they did because they laid the groundwork for many players I would follow. Jerry, did any teammate of yours along the way come to you and say, Jerry, tell me about Jackie Robinson, educate me. And were you able to do that with certain teammates you had along the way? You know, it's amazing. Uh, I would, you know, just being around the clubhouse, Tim and Jeff, you guys know this. We always appreciate, at least my generation, appreciated the, the players that have come before us. When players found out that my grandfather played in the Negro Leagues, they were asking me stories about him. And I remember when I first met Don Newcomb, I think I was a, a player with the Padres at the time. And he had spoke uh, on that day to us. I was at the Padres and, you know, the Dodger players were there. And he had spoken. He started pointing to me and my brother, Scott. And he started telling a story where, my grandfather, a veteran at the time, told Don Newcomb, who was a young and up-and-coming star, that he was going to take him deep. And Don Newcomb, you know, <laughs> 100 miles an hour, incredible athlete, 18 years old. He's going to challenge this old man, Sam Harrison, with a fastball. And my grandfather ended up take, taking him deep. So him telling that story, the entire room lit up uh, because a couple of guys didn't know that my grandfather played, let alone played in the Negro Leagues, and then eventually played in the big leagues. So... Uh, you know, they would come and ask, well, what, was, what did your grandfather say how the Negro League was like? What was Jackie Robinson like? What was Josh Gibson? I think I get more questions about Josh Gibson and Satchel Page than more about Jackie Robinson because Jackie Robinson's story has really been told. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, the Satchel Page, Josh Gibson story hasn't been told enough. And I think I, get, I used to get more questions about those two players, Satchel and Josh Gibson. Well, I mean, it it begs, what's your best Satchel Page story that you can share with us? Because you're right. We have Jackie Robinson Day. There's been great movies like 42 that have been created to honor this great man and his impact. But do you have a great Satchel Page story you want to share with us? I, I got a couple. So I got one Satchel and, you know, one Josh Gibson. Uh, because of time, I'll try to keep it brief. So Satchel Page, obviously, Tim and Jeff, you guys know now we're in the generation of pitch count, Right. Guys pitch uh, at, you know, 100 pitches, they're done for the week, right? <laughs> so Satchel Page, obviously because he was the draw, he was the Michael Jordan of his time in the Negro Leagues, especially during the barnstorming days, they would play two or three games a day. 
and then get on a bus, travel four, five, eight hours to the next city, post up there, get something to eat, get up the next day, and play another game or two. Satchel Page would sometimes pitch four or five days that whole week, okay, back to back to back days because he was a draw. So obviously he had a, he had an incredible fastball. He had a lot of great pitches because in order for him to pitch 80 to 100 pitches a night, he had to make sure he mixed and matches pitching. That's why he was such an artist on the mound because he couldn't go max effort every single day. And that's why a lot of players back then say, even the white players say that Satchel Page was the greatest pitcher ever because he had to pick up the baseball four or five times a week and go <laughs> wow. out there and manipulate the ball so he can go out there and perform. And now there's 11-year-olds on pitch counts. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Crazy. So, all right, your Josh Gibson story? Josh Gibson story. My grandfather uh, just was signed uh, to a Negro League team. Double Duty Ratcliffe was the manager of that team. Double Duty Ratcliffe, there's why they call him Double Duty Ratcliffe, because he pitched and he also catched. So my, my grandfather... Not in the same the- game, right? <laughs> Well, the first game, the first game of, of the doubleheader, he would pitch. The second game of the doubleheader, he would catch. That's so that's what they call incredible. 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 In- incredible. So he, he was uh, Shohei Otani before Shohei Otani. Right. Right? So Double Duty Ratcliffe, you know, signed my grandfather. So my grandfather is playing third base. Okay? My grandfather is an aggressive third baseman. Well, all, what walks a three-hole hitter by the name of Josh Gibson? Okay. Josh Gibson turns to the third to the third base line and he sees my grandfather even with the bat. Josh Gibson tells Double Duty Ratcliffe, "We well, got that young boy over there. He's in, you know, close to the grass. He's gonna get killed." <laughs> so Double Duty Ratcliffe tells my 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 grandfather, "Hey, take a couple steps back. Just take a, step, a couple steps back." <laughs> my grandfather's an eighteen year old kid. Okay, he doesn't know any better. He's heard of Josh Gibson, but obviously this is the first time playing against him. He takes one or two steps back. Josh Gibson turns and looks at my grandfather. Son, you better get back. Okay. <laughs> takes another step. A couple pitches later, he finally gets a pitch to hit. Josh Gibson hits a rope right past my grandfather's ear. Before my grandfather can put up <laughs> the glove, it goes right past his ear. He said he didn't see it. He heard it. And he could feel it. He said if it was a, a, a foot uh, to his left, it would have squared him up right in the face. So he learned that that day who the real Josh Gibson was, and he made sure from there on out, he made sure he was playing left field when uh, he came up the bat. Jerry, correct me if I'm wrong here. Your dad was drafted by the team that your grandfather played on. Was that kind of a cool moment for your dad when he found out he was getting drafted by the White Sox, that he's playing on on his dad's team that brought him into the league? Not only that, my grandfather was the scout that signed my dad, and he was drafted. My grandfather or my grandfather was a scout for many, many years uh, after his playing days. He also coached uh, in the minor leagues and in the big leagues. But as a scout, my grandfather drafted and signed – my dad. Now everybody goes, well, I know what your son goes, listen, you guys come see for yourself. He's going to Arizona state. He was going to go play there on a full ride, but come down. And we have a couple guys you need to look at Lamar Johnson, who my grandfather also signed Lamar Johnson played uh, many, many years in the big leagues and also my dad. So uh, he, they came out and saw my dad play and perform. And uh, they were able to take my, my, my dad in the third round. And my grandfather was the one there signing him. So Obviously, it was a good signing because he ended up playing 10 years in the big leagues. Right. I, I don't think I could get Jeffrey signed to play baseball, unfortunately. <laughs> Jerry, as you know, you played in the infield, you played in the outfield. I think it's hard for, you know, dad's been a sports writer for almost 50 years. I'm a fan of the game. But can you explain to everybody just how amazing of an athlete Mookie Betts is to be doing what he's doing, where he can play pretty much anywhere, it seems like, in the field? That's not easy. Listen, guys, uh, Mookie Betts is probably the best athlete on the planet. Now, obviously, Shoy Otani, incredible athlete, throws 100 miles an hour on the mound, great, great pitcher, can, can run, epic power. Patrick Mahomes on the, on the football field is second to none right now. Uh, there's a lot of great athletes. But Mookie Betts, seriously, he could be a professional bowler. He could run point guard for the Los Angeles Lakers right now. 
and he could be a slot receiver in the NFL. I am not kidding. He is that special of an athlete. He was drafted by the Boston Red Sox as an infielder. Okay, he was going to be a second baseman, but they had some guy named Dustin Pedroia who ended up pretty, being pretty good. So they asked Mookie, hey, why don't you go to the outfield? He makes himself not only an outfielder, he makes himself the best defensive right fielder that I've ever seen. I never got a chance to see Roberto Clemente. I heard Roberto Clemente in the scene footages was second to none. But I think he's on par with Roberto Clemente defensively. Now you ask him, hey, can you go back and play second base? I got you. Now, I got a chance to play golf with Mookie Betts a few months back. Uh, no warm-up at all. I'm sitting there on the drive range, me and James Loney, getting ready to, you know, to, to tee off. Mookie's running late because he had a prior commitment, runs late. He meets us on the tee box. I hit my nice little 265, make sure I'm on the fairway. James, you know, is, is a good shape. Mookie Betts hasn't swung a golf club, okay? Stripes at about 315, 330, right down the middle. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Literally, I wanted to throw my golf club at him, okay? That's how talented he is. He could have done any sport and thrived. We're fortunate to have him in Dodger blue, and he's lighting the world on fire right now with the bat. Jerry Harrison Jr. joining us. Thank you so much for your perspective on Jackie Robinson Day, the great stories, hearing about your grandfather. It's so important. I recommend everybody check out, if you get a chance, to go up to Cooperstown. They have an incredible display when it comes to the history of the Negro Leagues. It is so informative. It's so beautiful and so important to keep those memories alive to remember kind of how baseball started and it, it really is special. Jerry, I can't thank you enough for your time. Really quick, before I go, yes. I want to mention, Tim, it's not lost on me years ago. A lot of young people don't know this, but Tim was a baller on the basketball court. I remember <laughs> the first time, first time I saw Tim in, in, in the clubhouse in Baltimore, Cal Ripken was the one telling me, bro, this guy, Tim, lights it up uh, from the arc. <laughs> Did you believe Cal when he first said that, when looking at him? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I don't think Cal would lie to me. Right. He's and just... then I got I got other players telling me, and then I would see, uh, you know, it, I saw him shoot. And I was like, lights out, Tim. Lights out, Tim. All right. Jerry, this is what I did. I got it to Cal Jr. on the low block, and we won every game. He <laughs> dominated. I got him the ball. That's all I had to do. Amazing. Right. Well, Amazing. thanks again, Jerry. This has been an absolute pleasure having you with us. We'll see you down the road. We'll see you soon. Sounds good, guys. Thank you to Jerry Harrison Jr. for joining the podcast. And next week, we've got Terry Francona going to be joining us. So make sure to follow or subscribe wherever you listen. Now, to kind of put a bow on this whole great conversation about Jackie Robinson Day and the Negro League, is there a player that you think needs to be highlighted as well? In addition to who we talked about, Satchel Paige and Jackie Robinson, who else? Well, Buck O'Neill is one of the great players in the history of the Negro League. He's a Hall of Famer, and he did as much as anyone to promote the greatness of the Negro Leagues and Jackie Robinson. So Buck once told me the story that in 1945, he was on an army base in the Philippines when the news came down that Branch Rickey had signed Jackie Robinson to a organized baseball contract. So Buck O'Neill goes up into the tower at the army base. He gets on the microphone and he announces to everyone Branch Rickey has signed Jackie Robinson. And that night is essentially when everything changed and when everything got better because two years later, Jackie Robinson was in the opening day lineup for the Brooklyn Dodgers. So Buck O'Neill is huge in all things, including those with Jackie Robinson. Thank you so much for listening, and we appreciate you. We'll see you next Tuesday for a brand new episode. Thank you for being part of our family.